I've thought a lot about how to organize critical fallibilism into parts. I've made separate outlines and introductions with different organizations. I've done a bunch of drafts of this kind of thing. So now I'm going to talk about one possible organization that I think is useful to be familiar with. Critical fallibilism can be split into three parts. First is the epistemology. This is the decisive arguments idea, the binary judgments of ideas as refuted or non-refuted, the rejection of partial justification, partial criticism, indecisive arguments, weighted factors, etc. And included in this is a lot of the gold rat stuff about bottlenecks, constraints, limiting factors, key issues, local and global optima, focus, excess capacity, margins for error, buffers, and my addition to that list, breakpoints. And talking about qualitative versus quantitative differences. One way to explain breakpoints is that they are a point on a quantitative spectrum where there is a qualitative difference when you cross that point. They're usually not exact points, by the way, they have a margin of error around them. So you can think of it as there's the clearly the first category, and then there's the transition region. And then there's clearly the second category. And so it's called a break point, but it can really be a transition region where it's kind of in between. Sometimes they're very exact break points. Like if you're trying to fit something through your door, like new furniture, either pretty much either it fits or it doesn't fit. You can either get it through your door into your house or you can't. There's not much of a transition period. There is a margin of error if you're buying furniture at a store and you measure it and you're like, okay, this should fit, but you want to have a little bit of margin of error. Like if it will fit with an inch to spare, then you can be pretty confident you can buy it. If it's going to fit with an eighth of an inch to spare, your measurements might not be perfect. It might not fit. You got to be concerned at that point. There is some transition for this stuff, even with the door example, like you could take the door off its hinges to gain an extra inch or two. So part one of critical fallibilism is epistemology. It is about how to think and how to make decisions. It is not focused primarily on discussion or debate, although it has clear implications for discussion and debate. These ideas apply to and can be used when talking to other people, but their focus is more on how should you think, what is the correct way to think? And then if you're doing that, yes, you should use it when collaborating in your thinking with other people, which is kind of what a discussion is. So then the second part of critical fallibilism is more focused on dealing with other people. It's more external instead of internal. However, it has plenty of implications for internal. Again, it is related to rationality. And so it should be used for both internal and external thinking or for alone thinking or thinking with other people. It does have applications both ways, but the second part is more focused on dealing with other people. It could be summarized as the paths forward part of critical fallibilism. So it includes the paths forward ideas, asking questions like, if you're wrong, how could someone tell you? If there's someone who knows you're wrong and they're willing to tell you, what mechanisms do they have for that information to get to you? What if? They're right, but they seem wrong to you as your first impression. Are you going to ignore them and there's no way for you to be corrected? Or is there some way for that error to get corrected? Do you have things like a debate policy? Do you have transparency for how you deal with critics and people who want to speak to you? This applies more to people like public intellectuals than to people who don't even have a blog, but it is relevant to everyone to think about if you're wrong, how will you find out? But it is public intellectuals in particular who are most likely to have critics and people wanting to tell them ideas and correct them. Lots of people at least dabble in public intellectual type activities, though they have some 
intellectual discussions or debates of some sort. Especially my audience tends to do that kind of thing. If you have no interest in that kind of thing, you're significantly less likely to be listening to me. So other parts of Path Forward is how do we organize ideas so we can actually reach a conclusion in our discussions? And how do we use sources and incorporate literature and citations into discussions? And how do we protect people's time so that discussion isn't too time consuming, but we're also not blocking progress? How can we do that in a reasonable, effective way that isn't just some sort of unprincipled compromise or trade-off? A lot of what people do in practice is they filter ideas by social status and social networking. Like, if the idea gets to them through their friends, their peers, and the popular high-status people that they follow on social media, then they'll pay attention to it. And if it doesn't go through that kind of gatekeeping, then they don't pay attention to it. Or if it gets through the gatekeepers at an academic journal, then they'll pay attention to it, and if not. And so a lot of people, in some sense, are outsourcing their mechanisms for judging ideas to other people, often without having a good idea of what those other people are doing, without good transparency on how those other people are making decisions and how good their integrity is and so on. Some of those people that are outsourced to at least it's their job to do a good job at this kind of thing. Like, if you're expecting the editors of an academic journal to do a good job of filtering so that you actually get to hear about the most important ideas, and they just filter out the junk, I think that is unrealistic and you're naive. However, you are expecting them to do their job. A lot of filtering is makes less sense than that. Because you are, you have a bunch of friends on Twitter and then they retweet stuff, and then you see that, it wasn't their job to figure out what is the most important for you or for the field or something and retweet that. They retweet a lot of things because it's outrageous or grab attention grabbing in some way or clickbait or whatever. And, you know, that's a bit problematic, but it, it's not their job to do better than that, to use Twitter in a non-clickbaity way or whatever. It is not their explicit goal to only tweet really high quality, important stuff and filter things for you. They're just like you, you know, if you're trying to outsource to them, well, at the same time, they're trying to outsource to you and their buddies and hoping someone somewhere is going to use some judgment. So the first two parts of critical fallibilism are pretty focused on rationality and how to make that work. And the third part is about learning practice and mastery. It is how do we actually improve ourselves and get better at things? So it has some overlap with self-help and psychology. And it is something a lot of philosophers have overlooked or ignored, not treated as part of their field. An exception to that is Ayn Rand, who did talk about this stuff. And she's not the only one. But a fair amount of philosophers don't even try to deal with this stuff, whereas issues related to rationality are pretty common topics for philosophers. This is related to rationality too, but less directly related. And epistemology includes how to learn, but usually more in a theoretical sense, like how can knowledge be created? The answer is by evolution and you start talking about abstract issues rather than getting into details like why is practicing important instead of just reading a book and thinking you understand it? The practice and mastery stuff, that part of critical fallibilism, is the least original. You can find decently similar ideas in other places. Other people have thought about practice being important and why it's important that, that it can help you turn things into habits or make them automatic or make them intuitive so that you can go from I think one of the progressions they use is subconscious incompetence, and then you can get to conscious incompetence where you try to do it and you see your errors instead of not even seeing your errors. And then you can get to conscious competence where uh, you figure out how to do it. And then it's only with quite a bit of practice that you can go from conscious competence to unconscious competence where you have mastery over it and it becomes automatic for you. So a lot of people 
reach what they believe is conscious competence, and then they stop learning there. They think they're done. So often they'll read stuff, listen to stuff, think about it in their head, maybe write a small amount, and then they think they're done learning and now they've learned it. And then this is one of the reasons people don't really respect and value learning all that much is because that doesn't actually make their lives much better. It's not that effective. It's, it's good enough for them to have discussions about it and talk about it and bring it up in intellectual chit chat. But if you actually want to use it in your life, you have to practice things and figure out how to apply them in what situations, what do you do? How do you recognize when you should be using it? If you get a lot of experience with it, then it can play a larger role in your life and replace some of your older habits. And the reason that I've put a fair amount of attention and emphasis on this stuff is because I think it's really important and necessary for people to learn and use the first two parts of critical fallibilism, they need the third part, or it just won't do much. You know, in the past, I wrote a lot of essays, and I still write a lot of essays. And one of the things I observed over time is that people often will say, oh yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense. Great points. And then they don't really change their behaviors and their lives don't really change. And so I thought about why that is and looked into what they need to do differently and stuff. And so actually practicing things is one of the answers to that. In general, if you can't figure out how to practice something, like what actual activities to do, then you don't understand it very well. There are, that's not to say that you're wrong, but there's at least your understanding is incomplete. There's missing pieces. Your partial understanding, the bits you have might be correct. But even if they're correct, they're missing pieces, so it's not really going to work for much. A couple more related ideas are managing your error rate, which I've called not overreaching. Trying to understand at what rate you're making errors and at what rate you're able to deal with, manage, or correct errors, and then making sure that your error rate is below your budget, your maximum that you can deal with. If it's not, you will get overwhelmed and errors will accumulate faster than you deal with them. And so you'll end up with more and more errors and that will lead to failure. Another idea is that you need to be able to judge success and failure when you're trying to learn something that's a necessary part of practicing it and improving your skill is to be able to tell when you're doing it right, what the goal is. People often struggle to objectively judge when they've learned something, when they've succeeded. So they don't even know what to aim for with their practice, which is one of the reasons they don't practice. Often they basically just, they think they're succeeding. It feels like it. Their intuition says they're succeeding, but they have no objective metrics, no way to measure it, no way to establish it with logical reasoning. It's just sort of an impression that they have, and that's not good enough. That's not very effective. You shouldn't just trust your intuitions. You could go through life and be kind of average like that, maybe even above average if you're lucky, but that's not what philosophy is about. Philosophy is more like Socrates, who said the unexamined life is not worth living. Probably not an exact quote, but basically, Philosophy involves being reflective and trying to examine things and do better than your intuitions and whatever biases and thoughts your culture has stuck in your head, whatever static memes you've picked up, or even non-static memes. But philosophy is about thinking for yourself, being able to judge things and understand things yourself, and being able to do that consciously and explicitly, not just relying on intuition and hoping that your intuition is rational, but taking actual conscious control over your intellect. Not all of it all at once, but being able to do that is really important. 